is a mechanism of disease map for infective endocarditis, sometimes just called endocarditis. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of endocarditis. As in all of these flowcharts, each of these bubbles is color-coded according to this legend up here. And I'll be clearing each of these bubbles, each of these items, and talking through them one by one. So let's get started. There are two main etiology, pathophysiology mechanisms that lead to endocarditis. The first is damaged valvular endothelium, and the second is some type of infection or contamination of the body with a bacteria or fungus. When you have damaged valvular endothelium, you'll have exposure of the subendothelial layer. This results in platelets doing its coagulation cascade thing. So the platelets will adhere and fibrin will form and you'll kind of go through the coagulation cascade and build tissue upon the exposed subendothelial layer. This can result in a vegetation. In this case, it's called a sterile vegetation, uh, vegetation if there's no bacteria infecting it or if there's no other um, organism in it. And the problem with this vegetation is that it can kind of break off and create a thrombus in the bloodstream. Now on the bacteria end, if you have a localized infection, like on your skin, maybe a pneumonia, maybe a UTI, that can lead to a bacteremia or bacteria in the blood. Bacteria in the blood can then colonize this vegetation. So it's no longer a sterile vegetation and now becomes an infected vegetation. And the same thing can happen. It can still break off, it can still cause thrombi. Those thrombi or thromboemboli sometimes are septic then if they have a bacterial infection. And they can be thrown off into the bloodstream and cause all kinds of problems. They can cause vessel occlusion, which is a cardiovascular problem because you're no longer getting blood flow. So that can lead to infarctions. They can also metastatically infect other organs. So you now have an infection on your heart valves and your heart pumps blood to all the other organs in the body. So all of those other organs can be seeded with the same infection that came from the heart valves. So that's called a metastatic infection. And we'll get into the manifestations and we'll see how it affects many other organ systems. Another pathophysiologic mechanism that's worth knowing is that when you have exposure of the subendothelial layer, you're also exposing tissue antigens. And it's possible that the immune system relax, sorry, re reacts to these newly revealed antigens. So you can have immune complexes and antibodies against these new antigens. And kind of going down this way, the bacteria that colonizes the heart um, tissue can actually encase the vegetation and cause valve destruction and loss of function. So it's possible that your valves are already damaged to begin with, but they can certainly be damaged even more with this bacterial colonization. This can also inf uh, spread to the rest of the heart. It can spread to the cardiac septum or the valve annulus, and you can have an abscess form on the heart. So we'll see some manifestations that come from the valve destruction and from infection or abscess formation on the heart. Before we get into the manifestations, let's go through the etiologies. They're, they can be broken up into two categories. You can have cardiac conditions that lead to damaged valvular endothelium, and you could have non-cardiac risk factors that mostly lead to this infection or contamination. Here are the cardiac conditions. If you've had a prior infective endocarditis, that can predispose you to future infective endocarditis because the prior one probably damaged your valvular endothelium. The problem with damaged valvular endothelium is that it makes it easier for bacteria to get caught in it. Imagine an endothelium that has cracks or breaks or scar tissue. Bacteria is more likely to colonize that than it is to colonize a smooth, healthy endothelium. Some kinds of acquired diseases like aortic stenosis, usually in older men, or other degenerative diseases of the valves can lead to damaged valvular endothelium and also predispose you to infective endocarditis. Rheumatic heart disease, which of course comes from a throat infection, but later becomes an inflammatory process where uh, the immune system reacts to an exposed antigen, that can also cause um, damaged valvular endothelium. There are some congenital defects. These are hereditary um, congenital things like a VSD and a bicuspid aortic valve that can predispose you to have a damaged endothelium. Cardiac implantable devices. These um, predispose you to having staph epi, staph epidermidis, and um, this includes like pacemakers and ICDs as well. 
Prosthetic heart valves also predispose you to staph epidermidis, and all of those can lead to damaged valvular endothelium. The prosthetic heart valves might also predispose you to having an infection. Um, when you have the placement of these devices, these are procedures that can lead to an infection through the skin. Now for the non-cardiac risk factors. Dental procedures are shown to be associated with viridians strep, and that can cause an infection through your gums. In general, having poor dentition predispose you to these five organisms. They're all gram negatives. They're called the Hasek organisms. That can also cause an infection through your gums, which seeds a bacteremia and causes infecto endocarditis. Any kind of non-sterile venous injection can cause a bacteremia. And the most uh, prevalent cause of that probably is IV drug use. So these are people who use IV drugs and they're not necessarily using sterile needles or new needles every time. Um, they might not be using sterile liquids either. So they might be injecting all kinds of bacteria into their veins. Other skin problems, for instance, if you have recurrent hemodialysis, you might constantly be getting needles put into your body um, from the skin flora. You'll again have the staph epidermidis that can cause an infection. Intravascular devices can do it too, and any kind of recent surgery where you have a break in the skin or you're getting operated on can also cause an infection. People that are immunocompromised are particularly susceptible to these fungal organisms, Candida and Aspergillus, which I've abbreviated here. So that's a different kind of infection than the bacteria we've discussed so far. These are some things that might predispose you to being immunocompromised. HIV, of course, can make you, uh, can make you immunocompromised, and uncontrolled diabetes can make you immunocompromised as well. Lastly, generally any infections can be an infection of the skin, can be a UTI, um, Enterococcus faecalis is the most common one from UTIs, spine infections, gum infections, again these gum infections predispose you to these gram-negative HASEC organisms, um, all of those can lead to a contamination that leads to infective endocarditis. Last thing that's worth noting here is that Staph aureus is a pretty common bacteria for this condition and this usually leads to an acute infective endocarditis where the patient has symptoms very quickly um, and oftentimes very severe symptoms. So Staph aureus is a very um, quick um, pathophysiology, leads to quick manifestations. Lastly, some other etiologies, some other predisposing risk factors. Men tend to get this more than women and older people above the age of 60 tend to get this more as well. So that's the etiology. We've already discussed the pathophysiology. Next, we'll get into the manifestations that kind of branch off of these points in the pathophysiology. The manifestations can be broken down into cardiac manifestations, and later we'll see extra cardiac manifestations. So of course, if you have valve destruction, if you have loss of function of your valves, you can have a new heart murmur. You can also have a changing heart murmur, so that's also significant. If a heart murmur, for instance, started at one out of six and is now newly three out of six, that would be concerning for infective endocarditis. If you have really bad valve destruction and the valves are no longer functioning, you might have heart failure. You might have decreased cardiac output as a result of your valves no longer working. So the patient might present with heart failure symptoms. This can include dyspnea or shortness of breath as well as lower extremity edema and leg edema. If the patient has this infection that spreads throughout the heart and they have abscess formation, this might result in problems with the heart's electrical conduction system. So they might have a conduction delay this can result in a new arrhythmia. So you might notice arrhythmia symptoms like palpitations, or you might see the arrhythmia on EKG. And in any case, this is a cardiac manifestation of a spreading infection um, arising from infective endocarditis. So those are the cardiac things. These are gonna be the extra cardiac things. And as we mentioned, you can seed many other organs with an infection and cause manifestations throughout the rest of the body. Let's start with the spleen. If you occlude the splenic artery, you can have a splenic abscess or just a spleen infection. This can result in splenomegaly, and this might present with right upper quadrant pain and possibly splenic rupture. If this septic thromboemboli ends up going to the brain, you can have a septic embolic stroke. You can also seed a meningitis or an encephalitis, and of course you can have brain abscesses from this. So you might present with neurosymptoms. This includes paresis, weakness, visual deficits, seizures. Your general stroke symptoms are included as well. If you have a thrombi that goes to the retinal capillaries, this is probably going to be a microthrombi because these are very small capillaries. You can end up with round retinal hemorrhages. These are classically known as Roth spots, hemorrhages in the eye from the microthrombi. 
You can have a microabscess that goes to the skin, <clears throat> and this usually leads to surrounding necrosis and inflammation, um, kind of beyond the dermal layer. And uh, when you have this microabscess, it ends up being a non-tender red macule on the palms and soles of the patient. And those are classically called Janeway lesions. You can also have uh, little abrasion, little microthrombi that go to the skin that cause petechiae, and these are commonly seen as splinter hemorrhages. These are small lines of uh, discoloration under the fingernail. It almost looks like a patient has a splinter under the fingernail, and it results also from these septic thromboemboli that are thrown throughout the body. The kidneys can also be affected, so you can have a thromboemboli that goes to the renal arteries and include the renal arteries that supply blood flow to the kidney, and this is where the immune complexes come in as well. The immune complexes can cause inflammation in the glomeruli, causing glomerulonephritis. The problem here is that you can end up with an acute kidney injury, so you might see an elevated creatinine, and the patient might present with hematuria or anuria, so another organ affected, the kidney. You can also have these immune complexes that deposit in the pads of the fingers and toes, and this leads to painful nodules. These are classically called Osler nodes. So it's important to differentiate between the painful nodules in the fingers and toes, Osler nodes, from the, um, uh, from the painless lesions on the palms and soles called Janeway lesions. So Osler nodes are painful, Janeway lesions are less painful. An earlier symptom, sometimes a nonspecific symptom, is myalgias and arthralgias. So the patient can generally have muscle pain and joint pain, thought to be from these thromboemboli thrown throughout the body. And in general, all of these are kind of arising from the systemic circulation. So the patient might have had infective endocarditis in the left heart, which provides blood for the systemic circulation. This is to differentiate from the right heart, which provides blood to the, to the lungs, to the pulmonary circulation. So um, if you have an infection of the right heart, and that's usually the tricuspid valve, you can then have pulmonary problems, as we'll see with this last box here. And as a reminder, one of the common causes of this is IV drugs. Um, if you were going to seed something through your venous system, if you're going to inject something into your veins, one of the first valves that it sees is the tricuspid valve. So that bacteria that you're injecting with IV drugs, in many cases, can end up hitting your um, tricuspid valve first. The tricuspid valve then releases septic emboli that can cause pulmonary embolism, pulmonary infection. Um, you might see this as a multifocal pneumonia, where instead of having one area of pneumonia, you might have multiple lobes affected. You can also have lung abscesses and a lung empyema. So this presents with a variety of symptoms, including shortness of breath, pleuritic chest pain, cough, malaise, weakness, weight loss, and night sweats, as well as fever, chills, and tachycardia. So all kinds of lung infections um, can arise from the right-sided infective endocarditis. And just to clarify, the rest of these were from usually from left-sided endocarditis, and it makes sense because they um, come from the left-sided heart and they affect your systemic circulation. Some general lab tests, you might have positive blood cultures, and that might be how you diagnose infective endocarditis. Hopefully you'd identify one of these um, organisms that are commonly known to cause infective endocarditis. On your analysis, you might see hematuria and nephritic uh, sediments that would arise if you've had renal artery occlusion, um, an AKI, and a glomerulonephritis picture. And on your general labs, your CMP, um, CBC actually here, um, you might see these inflammatory markers, um, these uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate and C-reactive protein, as well as a leukocytosis, high white blood cells on your labs as well. The definitive test is then usually echocardiography, some classic findings include valvular vegetations. It might be described as hyperechoic mobile masses located on the valve or mural endocardium or the prosthetic material if the patient has a prosthetic heart valve, as we saw in this etiology here. You might also see a new valvular regurgitation or a worsening valvular regurgitation in the, in the case of infective endocarditis. So this has been a mechanism of disease map for endocarditis. I hope this was helpful and thank you for listening.